Hi, how's it going? Let me know if you can hear me. You might have heard, um, <laughs> did you hear a crash? And me go, ah! <laughs> because if you did, uh, it, meant, it means that you heard when my microphone fell over. Uh, hey, how's it going? <sighs> um, so usually I have like, so I did, I did theater for a long time, you know, for a long time, professionally. You know, I got paid to be on stage and like perform theater, you know, I did. And, and I realized, you know, I'm pretty, I'm pretty, is it superstition? Is, is the, is an actor or performer superstition really superstition? Or is it sort of a compulsive, obsessive thing? I don't know. I mean, I have to have certain things, you know, exactly the same every time. I mean, really, we've talked about the, the chips that just do not like the green screen at all. You know, my moldy electric chips, crisps that I like, but I have to have them. <laughs> I have to have them. My water, you know, things can't be too messy. I don't really like that my planner and my phone are over there. I don't like that, hmm, things need to be, hmm. And um, yeah, I mean, it just, I don't know. So, so I had lots of time today and it was like too much time because usually I'm running around like a crazy person, like, you know, ah, 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 like getting the crisps and fixing, you know, my hair, which never works, you know, ever. Uh, but, you know, but today I had more time. And so I actually forgot a few things, you know? And so I think it's better for me to have this compressed amount of time because I'm very focused on getting everything just right because I wasn't focused on it because I was like, ah, I have all the time in the world. And then I had, I had issues. But one of the things I did today was add another sound effect. Isn't that great? Thank you, thank you, it's so great. I, I, thank you, thank you. So we, we, we had that one, right? And then if something goes, you know, terribly wrong or there's just a big problem or we're very angry at something, you know, it's like, I, thank you. And then, but today I remembered that I promised you all, you know, basically, when something's like quilt church, you know? So, um, so I got that done. Ah, I got that done. And there's so many things to say tonight. So many announcements. Um, there's a lot going on and, uh, and it's really exciting. So I have my, you know, quilt nerd content plan. And in this, in this box, that's the, uh, announcement box and there's lots of announcements. So, uh, if you're just tuning in, hello, welcome to quilt nerd. Um, this is like the most fun I've had standing up uh, and uh, the most fun I've had in a long time. I love making this show for you. Um, and I love making this show for the people who have been here from the start four months ago, end of July, this thing started. And uh, yeah, there's some people who have been here from the beginning and a lot of them are here tonight. So I want to say hi to Sue. And wait a minute, wait a minute. Where was, I saw Yovana. I saw you, where is my, hmm. I'm gonna refresh this chat. I thought I saw Yovana in her first, which is awesome. And, uh, but mm, I'm looking at my thing and I don't, anyway. So hi Yovana and uh, Sue. And I'm gonna go through this, uh, oh wait, what was that? Oh, am I still, no, okay. Anyway, so uh, I wanna say hi to Sylvia and Debbie in, uh, okay, good, Debbie didn't hear a crash. They're in YouTube uh, land. So as my chat is loading up, um, I will make an announcement. One of the announcements is that um, there's gonna be a New Year's Eve show. Yeah. Eric's gonna be gone, okay. Um, he's not going to some fabulous party. <laughs> Nobody, I, I, I think a lot of people are not going to a fabulous party, including me. Um, unless you count the Quilt Nerd show that's going to be um, on New Year's Eve. So, you know, it's gonna, what am I gonna do? What am I gonna do? I wanna hang out with people. You might wanna hang out with people. And why can't we just do it together? I mean, it's live, right? It's like a party. I don't know what, I don't know what it'll be. I'll wear a dress. I'm gonna wear something <laughs> extremely fancy, obviously. I'll wear my diamond earrings, you know? And, um, and we'll just, we'll just figure it out. You know, we'll probably look at quilt stuff. I'll try to find some New Year's, New Year's quilt. I don't know if that's possible, but, uh, but you know, 
I can find something, or maybe you can. We can find some sort of old Lang Syne quilt or something we can look at. But whatever it is, at 1030 on New Year's Eve, hang out with me if you want. You know, it's safe. <laughs> it's safe. We're not going to... We're not going to, you know, screw anything up, hopefully, if we we're hanging out. So um, I want to say hi to Lainey Lou and Padma. And, uh, yeah, I don't know. I think I think I maybe lost a little bit of the chat at the top. I don't know why, but I'm saying hi to Dee Marie and Kay. I'm really glad you're here, Kay. And Kelly didn't hear the crash. Okay, great. Um, and Padma's here. Little Bird Stitch. Super weird. Super weird. I'm not getting all of the chat. But I'm sure that it'll be fine. And, um, yeah, yeah, I don't know, I don't know. Uh, so, but I, everything, everything's gonna work out just fine. I tried to do a new chat thing, so we'll see if it even worked, I'm not sure, I'm not sure. The other announcement is uh, that I was gonna take next week off. I made some crazy talk about that because I did so many shows, you know, in the past couple weeks, but that's, that's not gonna happen. I, I'm not gonna take any time off. I mean, I don't want to. <laughs> and I'm not like, you know, burn out or anything. So why? So so next week, um, next week, Tuesday show, Thursday show for sure, Saturday show, Saturday at eight. So the Twitch schedule page is totally updated. And if you're in the discord, um, I put up a PDF of the end of the year schedule. So check it out. And something really exciting. So this is the third announcement. Is that right? Yeah, the third announcement. This is kind of scary. It is. It's kind of scary. Um, hey, Teacher Stitch and Jill. I think so too, Jill. I mean, let's hang out. I'll get confetti. I'm gonna make it. I'm gonna make it work. And I'll test the confetti against the green screen because, you know, if the chips don't, if this doesn't work, I mean, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I'll figure out. Maybe I'll do like a confetti green screen or something. I'll figure it out. I'll figure it out. I'll practice. It'll be great. It'll be great. Cake, champagne, you know. Let's just do it, you know, together. So anyway, but Saturday night, Saturday night, what is Saturday night? Is that the first then? Oh God. Anyway. Um, yeah, is that, well, I better look. <laughs> Hang on. I better look. So, so not New Year's, New Year's Eve is Friday. Okay, right. Saturday night, we have a show. We always have a show on Saturday. And uh, on Saturday, I'm going to debut a video for you. Um, you all know definitely how I feel about the whole quilt clothes thing, cutting out quilts for clothes. You know, it's a problem. It's a problem. Um, so, and I've been working on this manifesto, right? The Cutter Quilt Manifesto. And it's, uh, I, I've been working on it very hard, but I realized about, you know, as I was just writing away on this thing, to sell, to sell this cutter quilt manifesto thing at QuiltCon and then online, um, I realized that it's so it's so bad. The the problem is so bad with all these people cutting up quilts to make stupid fanny packs and stuff, dog collars, cat cat collars, that I really I need to make a video now. Like I I need to get like the word out, right? I need to get the word out, and there's no better chance for the word to get out than if I make a video and put it on YouTube. And I think I told you all about this that I was gonna do it, um, but you know, but I'm I've been making it. I've been making it. I've written the script. Um, it's pretty much ready. It's mo it's, it's not extemporaneous. It's it's scripted, but it's uh, you know I'll have it in front of me and I'll be reading from it. But I'll you know, it's not like. I have a teleprompter, right? Um, thank you, Kelly. Exactly. So, hey, Holmes. Holmes, Holmes. Your days are mixed up. Same. I don't know what's going on. Hey, Myra. Thanks for subscribing for four months through Prime. I really appreciate you. Thank you very much. That's great. Uh, I hope I hope lots of people subscribe. Hey, Susan. And Mark. Hey, Mark. Yeah, I think I, we, can find, we can find some New Year's thing. Um, yeah, I've had my, I don't want time off. Hey, Prairie, this is your first chat. Prairie Susie, I'm so glad you're in the chat. This is great. Well, I'm glad you're here because Mother Nature is here. This is great. Um, Teacher Stitch, Little Bird Stitch, if I missed you, it is not It is not on purpose. I mean, obviously, like, oh my God. NDH, okay. So here's, so I need your advice. And we're gonna get, we, we talk about quilts here. I'm gonna tell you what we're doing here. I'll tell you about why this show exists and all of that, okay? So just hang, just hang on. But the thing is, is that I need some advice and it's serious. So I'm making this video 
and it is a direct address to the people who make this stuff, okay? It is, it, the, the video is called We Need to Talk About Quilt Clothes, okay? There's a lot of graphics, there's a lot of, I mean, it's really gonna be good. I think it's gonna be good. I've been working on it, right? I get up at five in the morning and I work on this thing and I really wanna get it done and I wanna put it out there. I'm frightened because it's, I'm pulling no punches here. I'm telling very plainly the world why this is not okay and why if it was okay for a minute, it has to stop because it's gotten out of hand, okay? So here's my question. I made a survey, okay, because I have this lecture coming up at QuiltCon, okay, in Phoenix, Arizona, on quilts and fashion, right? So I, I made a survey, and it's very, I could pull it up. Honestly, I kind of want to show you. Look, tonight's stream is going to probably be really long because I have a lot of great content for you. Great content. Susan McCord, um, amazing, famous quilter, right? Dead, right? Uh, Susan Hoffman, but uh, you just... Get ready. If you know Susan McCord's quilts, you know that they're some of the most famous quilts in America. And we're gonna look at them and I'm gonna read to you from, from this, okay? Amazing, she's amazing. And because I know I'm jumping around, but I, I know exactly where I'm going with all this. Um, we, I went to the, look at that. Look at that wheel, those wheels. Isn't that crazy? That's a quilt. Anyway, so we're gonna look at that. And, and I went to the Henry Ford Museum with Quilt Folk Magazine when I was editor of that magazine, and we took really lovely photographs of a number of Susan McCord's quilts, like right there in the archive, in the collections room of the museum. So this book has some decent pictures, but I have access to really, really good pictures, detail pictures. So I've put that all together for us to look at. And then, then we're gonna go, we're gonna take a quick break, and then we'll go to Susan Hoffman, who I believe is alive, sorry. Um, and she was with Molly Upton, you know, the, the famous Molly Upton and Susan Hoffman. We're going to look at Susan Hoffman. And I have, like, her artist statement print. I mean, I've got all kinds of stuff for you tonight. But, but this is where we start, okay? Because I wrote a survey. And I am going to pull it up. I didn't, I didn't think of doing this. But it's right here, and it's, uh, it's important. I wrote a survey questionnaire to send to designers of quilt clothes and accessories, okay? And the reason that I made this is because what I wanna do is approach this whole thing, hopefully with some data, you know? How many people are selling clothes like this? How many hits do I get on Etsy when I search for quilt clothes? Um, hey, quilting time. Um, and how, do, and, and you know, how many pieces do you sell a month? You know, like, I'd like to get some data on this, I, just because it, it makes the whole thing sort of more legit, and I'm curious, right? Okay, so let me, let me just show you what I got here. And, and my quandary is, um, my quandary is this. So let me, um, let me go down here real quick. Okay. So I've sent this this uh, questionnaire to like just four designers so far, okay? And I'm gonna send it to a bunch more and I need to do that like tomorrow, I have to do it. Um, but the questions that I'm asking are extremely neutral, okay? They're very neutral, such as, when did you begin making and selling quilty items? Were you making and selling other types of garments or handmade items prior to that? Where do you sell your work? Which of these items do you offer in your shop? Check all that apply, you know, garments, baby clothes, accessories, da 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 In terms of design and production, do you work alone or with other people? How many garments do you sell per month on average? Okay, so this, this is what, this is the kind of thing that I'm doing, okay? Here's my, here's my ethical dilemma. I am, I would never, and I will never, of course, like, uh, name anyone by name in this video. No designers will be named, you know, uh, by me. I will not, you know, talk about someone specifically. And that uh, questionnaire, by the way, is anonymous, okay? It's anonymous. I don't have their email address. You know, when they re respond, it's totally anonymous. But my ethical dilemma is I am not... Uh, 
giving them any leeway, the designers and the, and the makers and the sellers of this stuff. Like in the video, I'm quite clear that they have to stop and it's not okay and here's why. And I go through all the arguments and everything. Is it, is it okay to send this questionnaire to these designers with these very neutral questions and thank them for participating, okay? And then use that data, probably, maybe, in my uh, sort of um, very, like, like, I don't know, it's not mean, it's not like, but I'm vociferously against what they're doing. I don't want to, I don't want them to feel used. I don't want them to feel like I tricked them. A journalist who asks questions of a politician can write whatever they want later, right? So I think journalism sort of, honestly sort of protects me from having this be ethically wrong. <laughs> but I am asking you because like, I don't want some, because like four designers have already replied uh, with their answers and I don't know what, which one was who and whatever, you know, but, but I don't want to ask them to do something and then like flame them basically. So what do you think about that? Because I, I really appreciate people who are going to do this and I'm not, I'm not tricking them like, oh, it's really great what you're doing. Right? Like I'm, it's not like a, like that. So let me see what you're thinking here. Um, Hey, Sylvia. Hey, H2O. I got to refresh my chat. What's going on with the, where are they getting the quilts? Well, that's part of the, hey, Sila. Oh, nice, nice. Um, yeah, I'm so sorry, guys, why this is sort of, huh, I'm just not seeing the chat at this very important moment. I don't know what's going on. I see the YouTube coming in here. <clears throat> um, hmm, hmm, hmm. Let me, let me try something here. Um, I'm frozen. I'm frozen. Oh dear. Okay. 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 I'm frozen. Ah. Let me say something here. Um, hmm, hmm, hmm. What I'm going to do, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to see if, hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Okay. Yeah. I think it's okay. I think we're going to be all right. I think we're going to, I think it's coming back. I think I think it's coming back here. So I'm gonna, hmm. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Technology is so much fun. Um, let me just. Yeah. Okay. 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 So so. Okay. Mother Nature. Let me let me go up here. Um, autonomy. Con okay. Yes. Ben benef. Wow. Sue Sue says beneficence, non malfeasance, autonomy, and justice constitute the four principles of ethics. Wow. Huh. Oh, that's. Awesome. You set the tone with your invitation to respond. Let them know the stats will be used in an upcoming lecture, and this is for data gathering purposes. It's exactly, I didn't, yeah, what I didn't read you is the email to the designers, which says I'm, I'm doing research, I'm gathering data. It's anonymous, completely anonymous. I will not even know what your answers are. I just know who I'm sending it to, and it will, okay, so... Panma, you definitely have a bias, but to be fair, you should accurately portray the feelings of the other side in your article. Yes, but you can present your own as well. Absolutely. If you disclose, you will not get a survey response. Exactly. If I say like, I'm against this, but I want to know how you're feeling about it, it'll totally, it won't work, right? So Court Quilt says you're protected. This could start an important conversation. Mm -hmm. You need to have courage and face potential backlash or perhaps a different perspective, absolutely, from a seller that can blow your mind. 1,000%, 1,000%, I agree. Uh, it's important, however, the outcome. Okay, you're back. I know, the chat is weird, but but I'm back. Okay, good, Ivana. I, we just, it's like baby steps with all this these changes I'm trying to make to the format, you know? Oh. To the, uh, the layout. Little Bird Stitch, do the designers know the survey's coming from you? Yes, yes. Do they know why you're asking? Yes. Will you share the results of the survey with them prior announcing to the public? No, no. And, and the thing is, is the questions are, at no time are they, do you realize that you're damaging, you know? In fact, in fact, in fact, let me show you this. Let me show you that. Um, there's something else important here. 
Um, one of the other things that I ask them is, well, I mean, it's so important, this data, right? Like, um, would you describe the, by the way, there's, what is there? Less than 20 questions. Most of them multiple choice. Do you, would you describe the quilt clothes retail space as competitive? Do you think the vintage quilt clothing trend is increasing in popularity, stable, or waning? Yeah, this is like neutral stuff. And then, and, and then at the end, uh, da, 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 da. how often, if ever, do you receive criticism via comments on social media posts, emails, phone calls, etc., from people who disagree with using vintage quilts as material for clothing? I've never received criticism every once in a while, but not often, fairly often, all the time. So, you know, it's like, okay. And then the last question is, to those who disagree with using vintage quilts in garments and other goods, what is your response as a designer slash maker? So I give them a chance to say their piece, you know? So, okay, so it seems like, Susan, okay, so Mark, why would you not take a stand? Yeah, <laughs> well, so, so the thing is this, is that I've been working on it hard. I'm not forcing anyone to answer, it's true. It's true. Okay, exactly. Okay, good, good, good. It's all up front. It's very, very clear. Okay. Okay, good, Prairie Sue. Prairie Susie. Good. Okay. I mean, I'm really asking. I really wanted to bring it to you because, you know, I, I'm, you can't be everybody's friend and whatever, but I don't, I don't want to make everything worse, you know, like in general, do no harm, you know, try not to do, make everything worse and you're going to make mistakes. I've made mistakes hurt people, screwed up, you know, messed up, whatever. But I don't want to, I just want to do that as, as little as possible. And so making a very public statement about something that will affect, if I succeed, that's the thing, if I succeed, if the video succeeds and it gets out there at all, people who make this stuff, was gonna, they're going to see it. And it's like, they're gonna, they're gonna, they're not gonna like me at all, you know. And that, and I don't want them. The last thing I would want would to be have somebody be like, "I helped you, and you did this," you know. So that's not what it is. It's like I have, I'm doing research. I need to get some data. This is this neutral thing. Will you do it? And then from there, it's, I can do what I want with the information, right? Okay, so I really wanted to ask, and it's scholarship. Yeah, exactly. Okay, cool, cool. I really appreciate it. I really, really appreciate it. So, thanks everybody a lot. Um, I worked so hard, Dee Marie, on the questions to make them like really neutral. Okay, so thanks, Karen. So, and Karen, hello. Um, and Panna says, would you say your questions give away your viewpoint? If so, should be fine because they know what they're up against. They do not give away my viewpoint. They don't give away, they don't. It's like, it's really like how many, about how many quilt items do you sell a month? You know, zero to 10, uh, 20 to 50, something like that, you know, 60 to 100, over 100. Um, I mean, it's, it's sort of like robotic almost. There's, there's, no, there's no emotion in it at all, not either way. Um, and Crafts for Others, Val says, um, well, yeah, you know, Mother Nature, yeah. Anybody who receives a survey might know where you stand on the issue with a quick Google search. You're right. I've talked about this a lot on this show, right? So if they look, they'll they'll be able to see. Um, hey, Sylvia, how's it going? H2O Girl and Barbara. Um, I think I said it's Sila. Okay, 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 Sylvia, okay. So, and and Val says, and then I'll, then I'll wrap this up, but... Uh, yes, I did disclose that the data would be used for, you know, research purposes. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, sorry, if you're not your own viewpoint, it'd be considered more journalism. If the views will only be from your viewpoint, it would be considered an opinion piece. Yes. Yeah, yeah, that's true. And Lauren, hi Lauren, says, similar surveys go out to organic, fair trade, and socially conscious clothing companies of all levels. Mm -hmm. That data gets used, and if it sheds a more truthful image that they expect it, then they expect it, maybe they'll learn something. Okay. Thank you. Great. Um, so the deal is this, is that it's getting real close to be, being done. And, uh, and I'm going to show it to you on Saturday night. So this is after New Year's. Oh my God, it'll be like New Year's Day. Wow. So this makes me accountable for finishing it. And, I, you know, I, I must, I'm nervous about it. 
And so if I'm real nervous and I'm like, you know, been before because it's bigger than me. It's not about me. I'm just saying, look, this is a problem. We have to stop cutting quilts apart. We have to stop now. Like we do. And so if people get mad, like it's like, I kind of, I'm kind of ready for it, but I could still drag my heels wanting to make it perfect, perfect, perfect. So Saturday night, it's going to be ready and I'm going to show you and what I'll do. So it'll like premiere here. But then what I'll do is because I multi-stream to YouTube, I will, I will take down the YouTube video of the show, right? I'll, I'll remove the live stream of Saturday night's show from YouTube because I don't want people watching it on this show and then on the regular video. But, um, but I'll, but then I'll, I'll upload the video and like the next day. And if you all have like, like major objections, there's going to be people who don't, who don't, you know, think it's like the everything <laughs> but uh but I've really thought it through a lot and I think it's structured right and I'll show it to you all because I love you and you're my people and it's like okay here this is is there anything deeply effed up about it is there anything that is just really is really like if I have I just got a blind spot on something okay so that's Saturday night and it's a viewing party basically um Yes, and absolutely. So Little Bird Stitch, to have a real impact, it has to go beyond the quilt world uh, bubble into the mainstream, a thousand percent. You know what? I have never wanted to like go viral and to even say that is like embarrassing because maybe like 2,000 people will see it, 2,000 views, you know, and that's nothing. <laughs> but because it is so, it's, it's a strong position, there's not any other video out there about it. And I feel like if people share it because it's like, whoa, um, then maybe it will get around to some fashion people or some, I don't know. I've, I really want it to, I really want a lot of people to see it. So I'm trying to do it really well. We shall see. Yes, let it know. Okay, everybody. Um, thank you for take, talking with me about it. Um, We've got a New Year's Eve show. I'm not taking next week off, obviously, and Saturday night at 8 p.m. Central, we'll have a premiere. Okay, great, great. Mm -hmm -hmm. What are we doing first? Okay, so so this show, by the way, um, very brief, very brief uh, introduction. Um, we nerd out about quilts here. Um, quilts are more than just pretty blankets. They are their history. They're documents of history. They are, um, they're sort of a, a, they show our visual vocabulary as a nation. It's true. We have these wonderful traditions of making quilts. And then we have quilts that are being made today that completely blast away all the tradition that came before, you know, or they use pieces of the traditions that came before. We're going to look at a quilter tonight who does really amazing work and started making quilts in the 70s and the 80s that didn't look like anybody else's quilts. And, and she was so cool, you know. And if you're into, um, you know, philosophy, you actually have a reason to look at quilts because we just, no one can answer the question, are quilts art or craft? I mean, how would you answer that? Is it craft? Is it art? Is it really beautiful quilt art? Some people would say absolutely. And some people would say, no, no, no. You know, they, it's sort of, it's lovely. It's nice. You know, you can hang it on a museum wall, but it's still just craft. It's, it's a good question, right? And it has all these larger implications and, and what a quilt could sell for. You know, speaking of all that quilt clothes stuff, some of the clothes that I see, you know, these jackets made out of vintage quilts, $1,500, $1,500 for one of these things. But the quilt that they bought to make it, I've seen all these prices. I've been looking at all this stuff for like a year or more. $65, $100. One of the questions on the survey is about how much do you pay for a quilt on average that you'll use for your, for your work. You know, 65 bucks for a vintage quilt, sell a jacket for 500 how is a quilt worth more when it's destroyed? These are the questions we have, you know. It's not just that we like to look at quilts and we like to make them. We like to look at them and we like to make them. Most of the people who watch this are quilt makers, which is groovy, including myself. But, but the quilt nerds who are here, we have these deeper questions we want to know. And so we learn all about the world by looking at quilts. And so it's, it's that. That's what this show is, okay? And so we always start uh, the show with the quilt behind me. Um, and it changes every time. 
because you know green screen and and I'm gonna tell you that this this quilt behind me let me get small um, this is a quilt that is nothing's really known about it I found it uh, on the internet um, it's beautiful um, it's a detail picture and it's one of the images that I'm using in my video about the quilt clothes thing and it's I put it here because I've collected all of these different images right for the background I'm using the green screen in the video and um, it's just sort of one of those anonymous quilts. It's piecing, it's, it's patchwork. There's, there's not much to it. And yet, you know, it's, it's, it's this, <laughs> it's a perfect example of a quilt that would be turned into a jacket if nobody sort of points out that it's a quilt that still has use as a quilt. You know. So, and I knew that my announcement would be sort of long tonight. So this is a quilt probably dates to like, you know, 1890, 1900, maybe 1910. Um, it's a eight pointed star. It's three colors. I don't think that it's a patriotic kind of quilt, but it is red, white, and blue. Um, yeah, it's just one of those nameless, anonymous, anonymous artist unidentified um, quilts. And it's a close up shot of something that somebody made. Um, and I think it has value, and uh, I think you think that too. <laughs> uh, so that's it. That's it. That's our quilt tonight. A lot of time, most of the time, all of the time, we have a, a really deep dive into one quilt. But I wanted to to get things get things rolling tonight. So that's the scoop. Okay. Um, let's see. Karen, Karen, Karen. So in Karen, um, problem with the high uh, end garments. They have no real life. They don't get worn much. I know. I know there's so many problems. I take down all of the arguments in my in my video. Hey, Michelle Van Scrappy, I love stars too. Isn't this great? This quilt is great. It's just it's simple, and it's just you know, it's just yeah, it's just it is what it is. Right? Um, okay, so tonight let's look at Susan McCord. Let's look at Susan McCord, um, who is a I mean, I think one of the first quilt makers that I um, that I ever really um, heard about, like like my mom, you know, she would mention all kinds of things, and I would overhear all kinds of things um, when she was working on uh, the magazine with Liz, and you know, working on different things, quilts, working on quilts. I would hang out with her sometimes in her studio while she was quilting, you know. And I remember hearing the name Susan McCord. Um, and I know there's a, um, there are some people in the chat who, who know this name, right? Hey, write down. Woohoo! Oh, you got to see the show in Boston. That's so great. That's so great. I wish I could have seen it. Was it great? Um, Susan McCord is just a name I remember hearing, and I'm pretty sure it's because my mom made a quilt at some point, and she used one of the things we're going to see tonight is, is a vine. Susan McCord is, is famous, a famous quilter. She only made like 10 quilts in her life. We're going to look at most of them here in just a second, but she, let me see, let me go in here. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. She, um, she was really famous for her for these vines that she would do. Okay, I'm gonna zoom in here. Okay, um, I'm not gonna put the chat up on the screen <clears throat> just now because it's tender. It's it's tender. It's delicate tonight. It's a delicate flower. I don't want to mess it up. Um, so mom mom made some quilt with a vine on it, and and it was a, a copy of you know. A Susan McCord of mine okay so so this book that you're looking at I scanned it I scanned it for you today um, this comes from the Henry Ford Museum it's a catalog it's a catalog for um, an exhibit that they they must have had I mean right yes published on the occasion of an exhibition organized by the Henry Ford Museum and Greenfield Village Dearborn Michigan in 1988 1988. Okay. Um, oh, Susan, that's great. Um, so I'm going to read to you the, the first 
the you know the text about this as we look at some of her quilts. Has any do you have you heard of Susan McCord? Do you know this person? I know. Isn't this a great cover? Have you heard of this person? You uh, are in for a treat if you haven't, and if you have, you're in for a treat too. Okay, so wait, let me do let me do this. Hold on, single page. Okay, okay. So that is Susan. So he, and I'm gonna just I'm just gonna flip through as I I got a lot of pictures. So I'm just gonna read this and flip through. Um, that's Susan and her husband Green McCord. You can see that on the on the thing. Um, taken in about 1885, um, late in their life together. It's the only existing photographic portrait of the couple, okay? Susan McCord lived to age 80. Um, by the way, she was born in 1829. She died in 1909. So this is, you know, we're, we're taking it back. We're talking about traditional quilts right now. Quilt makers in the 19th century, straight up old school stuff. Um, Susan lived to age 80. She was kicked by a cow during milking and lay on the frozen ground for many hours before being found. Oh, oh, this is about her death. Oh, God. I thought it was some funny story about how she got kicked. No. She was kicked by a cow and lay on the frozen ground for many hours before being found, and she contracted pneumonia and passed away in 1909. Okay. Oh. Um, this is from the Henry Ford thing. Okay. 19th century... American quilts are often considered to be the epitome. We'll come back to that, this picture. We'll come back to this picture. Hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. Mm -hmm. I see, yeah, you see, you see the vines? Okay, let me get this all situated for you. Yeah. Uh, and let me tell you too, this is, this is from this book, right? This is from the scan. Okay, here. But this is one of the quilts that we got to photograph at the Henry Ford Museum for QuiltCon. And so just feast your eyes on these next few pictures because we have high definition, high definition detail shots of this exact quilt, which is a very big deal, by the way. It's a very big deal. You know, quilt fold. We get it. We get into the VIP places. Okay. <clears throat> 19th century American quilts are often considered to be the epitome of the seamstress's aesthetic expression. We are bewitched by the creations of industrious and often anonymous housewives. The finest quilted bed covers dazzle us with colorful pattern, intricate, intricate construction, and exquisite workmanship. The 10 quilts made by Indiana farm wife, Susan McCord, in the collections of the Henry Ford Museum are among the very best of the genre. Okay, subjective, but, ooh, look at this, oh, yeah. It wasn't hanging up, so we had to, we had to view it, you know, laying down there. But the, there's the detail on the, these pictures is just awesome. So this is the quilt in the drawer, laying flat in, in the drawer. Whoops, okay, yeah, here, this is great. Um, <laughs> these 10 quilts are representative examples of typical Midwestern quilting in terms of fabric use, color, uh, color scheme, and technique. On another level, however, Mrs. McCord, Mrs. McCord manipulated fabric, color, and designs, even on her quilts of traditional patterns, producing bed covers that were far from ordinary. Finally, McCord quilts uh, are, the McCord quilts of original design, masterfully engineered and executed, are extraordinary examples of American quilt making. Look at these little, I mean, oh, I just love a high definition photograph, don't you? Just so great, right? Yeah, okay. Ooh, a quilt library. Mark, I like that idea. Oh. Yes, yes, yes. 1880s. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Isn't it lovely? I know. Tiny, tiny pieces. Tiny, tiny pieces. Okay. Let's see what else we got here for you. Mm. It's just so whimsical. It's so nice. And then there's so many of these. There's so many vines. Okay, sorry. Unlike so many quilts in museum collections, in this case, we are able to associate a face and personal history with the, pro with the products. Susanna Noakes was born in 1829, probably in Decatur, Illinois. 
uh, sorry, Decatur County, Indiana, Indiana. Uh, known as Susan, she married school teacher Green McCord from Ohio in, in 49. They moved to Iowa and began farming, but returned to Indiana, settling in McCordsville, east of Indianapolis. Um, they spent the rest of their lives on an 80 acre for farm in McCordsville. Okay, so here, this is a scan from, from the book. And remember, she only made like 10 quilts. She only made like 10 quilts. Um, probably because they took forever. In the 1902 Country Atlas, Green was hailed as an early set settler and prominent community member. He's listed as an odd fellow, church elder, Civil War veteran, and staunch Republican. The odd fellow quilts. That's a folder. I have a folder forming about the odd fellow quilts. Have you heard of them? Have you, have you know of this whole thing? There are the odd fellows where there was this order of, of guys who, who did stuff, but there's a, there's a lot of quilts out there with odd fellow like imagery and references. It's not Masonic. It's different. Um, so I'm learning about that, trying to get that together for you. Yes. M Hicks, my mom made a quilt that had vines on it, just like Susan McCord. I should, I should ask her about that. I, I mean, I, I really should. I thought I, I thought I maybe could find it, you know, but I, it's, she's made a lot of quilts. So, okay. This is Harrison Rose, the Harrison Rose urn. Okay. What we know of Susan McCord is revealed through family reminiscences, reminiscences. This tiny bundle of energy <laughs> bore seven children. Like most farm wives, she was responsible for the homestead's dairy and poultry. She was a devoted member of her Methodist Episcopal Church. Um, she participated in sewing bees and things. Susan loved gardening and practiced homeopathic medicine using tree barks, roots, and plants for healing. Interesting. She sewed clothing for her flock of children, knitted accessories, embroidered bed sheets, produced decor decorative wreaths of human hair. <sighs> wow. And made at least 13 bed quilts. Okay, sorry. 13 bed quilts. Three of them remain in private collections. This one, look at this one. This is crazy. There's one detail shot of this from, this is all from this book, right? The color palette is amazing. I agree. I agree. I agree. Susan McCord is representative of many 19th century homemakers who were expected to raise a family, run a homestead, uh, and provide fancy work for the home. Such homemade goods saved the family money and it personalized the home and displayed their artistic talents. Writers Henry Williams and Mrs. C.S. Jones in Beautiful Homes in 1878 urged housewives to create lovely items for their dwellings, believing that, quote, taste dwells in unity with utilities and love, unquote. Okay, thank you, Mr. Henry Williams and Mrs. C.S. Jones. When women like Susan McCord, uh, when women like Susan McCord found time to construct such goods, remains a wonder. However, the 18 edition, 1820 edition of the American Frugal Housewife, <laughs> God, that's the magazine. Like, I really want to read a magazine. Let me, uh, let me get the latest issue of the American Frugal Housewife. Thank you. It was probably great, you know, I don't know, full of lots of helpful information. This is a detail shot of that. This is pretty good, actually. Actually, it's really good. Look at all those hexes. A flock of children. Yes, Padma. A flock of children. <laughs> yeah. Myra says, we have the Odd Fellows here in Seattle. The building that housed their order is historic in the Capitol Hill area of the city. Really? It houses a restaurant, shops, and a few other businesses. Eric's from Seattle. Where, do you, in the, ca what, uh, what restaurant? If you, if you know, let me know, because I'll ask him about it. Um, Okay. <laughs> so the American Frugal Housewife says, quote, the true, this is in 1820, the true economy of housekeeping is simply the art of gathering up all the fragments so that nothing is lost. I mean the fragments of time as well as materials. Nothing should be thrown away as long as it is possible to make any use of it. Unquote. That was Eric blowing his nose. Okay. Oh, 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 here we go, here we go. I wish, you know. I mean, I've seen this kind of quilt before. You don't see it a lot, but but this this quilt is is probably 
It's one of the most successful versions I've seen of this quilt. I, I mean, I don't know. I, it's not my favorite pattern, I have to say. It's a hexy, you know, with a twist, right? But I just don't... I don't know. It, it, I don't know. I just never liked it. It's, it's a, a strange personal preference thing. But I've seen it done with, like, you know, the, the Depression era mint green thing, like where the pink is in this quilt. I've seen it with that. It's just a lot of that color. And I've also seen, like, um, uh, a repeated color scheme where there's like green and orange and blue and red in like every single diamond and it just it's too much it's too much but but this 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 is works for me it works for me um the navy blue the pink well done susan well done um examining the fabric techniques and patterns tells us that the 10 quilts oh the 10 quilts in the henry ford collection right that's what they're trying to say okay oh this is the back this is a back of the diamond field. Um, and, and what it says is, the back of this quilt was partially pieced from a muslin bolt end that is stamped with a manufacturer's name and eagle logo. Susan used scraps like these in her quilt backings, the side out of sight or face down on a bed. Cool, huh? Um, hey, Bridgewater VA. Visit the sick, re relieve the distressed, bury the dead, and educate the orphan. That's the odd fellows. Yes. Okay. So, so the Odd Fellows are pretty cool. Like there were like, like there, there were chapters all over and they seemed to just be very welcoming to everybody. I mean, I think it was just men, I think, but I don't know for sure, but they seemed like legit. I don't, I didn't get a gross feeling when I was just looking at them very, you know, my cursory look. Okay. Um, brr, 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 hold on. Mm-hmm. 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 Mm -hmm. While Susan used traditional techniques, she also constructed three turn-of-the-century crazy quilts. We'll get to those. Um, pieced bed covers of dark, rich, heavy fabrics constructed in blocks of seemingly random arrangement, all range in the 1880s. Um, okay, look, let's just take a look at this. I'm gonna pause, pause on that. So this is Ocean Waves, and I'm so glad that I have detail shots of this quilt too. We have detail shots of the first one, as you saw. We have some detail shots of this one from Quilt Folk Magazine, issue eight, Michigan. And then detail shots of this one, the wheels, the wheels. Oh, it, they're so good. Melanie Zacek was a photographer and she's, she's a perfect human. Um, so the ocean waves, I mean, this is a classic, you know, it's a classic pattern. Um, <laughs> the triangles I mean the triangles and of course you have like the, the vines there again they're so they're so whimsical like this little flower is so sweet you know it's so it's so sweet and then and the vines are just so ornate right so she's got a lot going on but somehow it all comes together and all of these tiny tiny triangles I mean here's a question how did she do that <laughs> let's let me go to this let me go to this detail shot and maybe we can look at that. How's that? I mean, that's, ooh, sorry. That's just crazy, whoa. So how, how do you do that? I'm serious, like what, I know, I know. Oh, wow, you know what? Good job, Susan. Good job, good job. Okay, let me let me show you the, the quilt again, okay, really quick. Now, and this is from the book, not fabulous, but here's here's what, what she did, okay? She did that. And here's a close up of whoa of that of that part. I mean I see the half square triangles, but <laughs> I know. D. Marie, totally. I see the half square triangles, obviously, right? But then, but then this, this business, you know, how did she set those in? Like, how in God's name are you supposed to set in something that tiny? I don't understand. Is this appliqued? No. Is the white appliqued? One brown square. 
Oh, yeah. Look at that. That's funny. Interesting. Very interesting. Huh. I did not see that before. I did not see that before. Why seems? Yeah, Ivana. I mean, it just it just has to be. But like setting in these tiny, tiny things. That's crazy. Oh, it's crazy. Look at this lovely little polka dot, this little blue, blue polka dot right there. I love it. I love it. Yeah. And, and so so here's my other question, though. OK, wait, what do we have here? Okay, that, that's some of the vines. I'll go back to that. But so what are your units, though? Like, like how do these all connect? To put it very, like, it sounds like I've never made a quilt before in my life, but, like, how, what are your units? You've got your Y seams. Are you making, like, is, is like, this a, a chunk? Like, where does, where does it connect? Where do these sections of half square triangles connect yeah little bird stitch that's true that's true hand, hand piecing is when you have to do y seams you're, you're right i think hand piecing is easier than doing it on the machine yeah yeah totally although i've still got i've still got a problem with some with a hexagon y seam like i i've been making these stars in london i was making these six pointed stars with hexagons sort of in between them they were killing me. Um, but yeah, okay. Um, probably bits and pieces of clothing scraps from all those children. Yes, probably, absolutely. Strips of half square triangles. Okay, Ivana, totally. Neflinster says, hey Neflinster, are there seams across the white squares? Let's look. Seams across the white. No, I don't think so. This is a set in piece or this is a, a setting piece. Let's see if we've got another Hang on, these wonderful little details. Um, that, sorry, I can we can look at these more. Oh, that next picture is amazing. I think, hold on, I think that's, sorry. I just want, okay, I, we don't have another picture of the, the grid um, of the, you know, ocean waves part. But I can tell you that there aren't, um, there aren't seams here in the in this piece. Um, yeah, the yeah, I know, I know. HST sashing, quilting time. Hey, quilting time. HST sashing. Yeah, it seems a little bit like that. Oh wait, 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 wait a minute. Here, look. Yeah, they came together. It came together in the middle here right here this is don't you think this is a quadrant like <laughs> i can't do that <laughs> like the this 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 um cross shape comes together in the center if that makes sense so she's got like this chunk sort of like a you know like an elongated hexi does that make sense yeah where the waves cross it's an x Mm hmm pointed lines. I cannot believe that this quilt exists. I know, I know. So let's take a look at more of the, the vines and and um, we can all just, and we can look at, you know, if in the Discord, if you want to put it in there as you're talking amongst yourselves, you know, if there's an ocean wave pattern that you can find that would use that many small triangles. I mean, that's just, that's part of it to me is like a Y seam is, is a Y seam. But then if it's like really, 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 really tiny, I mean, how do you, how do you do that, right? It's crazy. Okay, let me go back to some of this. Hang on. Um, quilts are... Okay, wait, wait, wait. Yeah. Da, da, da. Interesting, interesting. Oh, yeah, okay. Her pieced quilts may have been... May, may be of traditional patterns, but they are set apart from their contemporaries in a number of ways. Um... Library fan, library fan worked with the Bicord quilts while a grad student in the 80s. Oh, that's so cool. Library, I love that. Well, you're a lucky person. That's really cool. Hey, Bonnie. She did. Um, for example, Susan used a pattern called Ocean Waves, but hers is pieced with exceptionally small scraps of calico. The hundreds of triangles surely taking out countless hours to piece together. Yeah. Turkey Tracks, which we'll see next, is notable for its combination of dark brown piecing and pink lattice tracery. 
Both ocean waves and turkey tracks are actually pieced and appliqued, for both are decorated with a sinuous green, look at this, sinuous green vine from which grow colorful buds and flowers. Her hexagon mosaic quilt, which we saw earlier, is pieced in a seldom seen pattern that echoes the shapes of the hundreds of bright scraps of hexagon shaped cottons that form the quilt top. Uh, and then they talk about the crazy quilts, which we'll see in a second. Look at that feather quilting. So beautiful, right? So beautiful. Little Bird Stitch is asking, how small do you think the squares are? An inch? Let's take a quick look. Yeah. I mean, is it an inch or is it a half an inch? Wait, yeah, it's an inch. It's totally an inch. I mean, yeah, Kelly, they're all stitched by hand. I know, okay, Val, I'm, I mean, let's look at the, that is, I don't know that that's an inch. This is a very, very close up, but you know, when you look at the full quilt, they're an inch. They, I mean, if they were a half an inch, I don't even think we'd be able to like discern them, right? I think, I think it's, I think it's an inch. Okay. Gosh, we just keep flicking back and forth on this one because it's so beautiful. Wow. Um, okay. Quilts are judged not only by composition, design, and color, but quality of workmanship. Susan McCord's piecing and quilting indicate that she was indeed a talented needleworker. Um, the stitching that joins top, filler, and backing um, is, is unfailingly even, arranging about 10 stitches per inch. Her patchwork quilts, such as Ocean Waves, and the two quilts formed of small hexagons were laboriously pieced of hundreds of bits of cotton before Susan ever began quilting. While these bed covers appear to have been constructed largely by a single hand, close examination indicates that Susan, here's turkey tracks, this purple is, I'm just here for it. Isn't that nice? That like wine colored purpley pink. It's not mauve. It's like magenta, like faded magenta. I love it. Um, so yes. Da -da 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 -da. Close examination indicates that Susan had assistance with at least some of the quilting and applique work. Uh, the scrap quilt called Diamond Field, which we saw her ele and her elegant Harrison Rose urn applique, which we saw one of the first quilts, and her well-known vine applique quilt, the first one, bear the stitches of at least two different hands. Perhaps fellow Methodist church members or her two daughters shared her labors from time to time. Still, considering the intricacies of these 10 quilts in the Henry Ford collection, it seems wondrous that even one of these quilts was completed. And that's exactly what a number of you are saying in the chat, which is just like, how? How are they? How are they real, right? They're pretty great. I really like this. I really, really, I want to point this out. This is way cool. Look, look, she, these different fabrics she used in the, in the turkey foot, right? The turkey, this is a turkey track block. That's what it's called, turkey tracks. And, you know, over here in this one, right, you, you've got, th you got two different fabrics and she's, you know, she's got the light and the dark, you know, arranged that way. I mean, this is just kind of, I'm sorry, it's badass. Like, this is a badass block. It looks like a, I don't know, it's very sexy, somehow very sexy. And and then, but then here, it might be faded, it's true, but here, in this one, whoop, sorry, in this one, you know, that's just one fabric, okay? But but the way, and but here, so she's got some of these track turkey feet that are different fabrics, and I think the effect is so awesome. It's this one over here. Look at this. I mean, it looks like a tiger's eye, like stone or something, you know? I mean, it's really cool. And Library Fan, yeah, I gotta get back to you. So Library Fan is over in YouTube land, says it was beyond cool to work with these Susan McCord quilts, but collection management was in the dark ages. Oh, interesting. And uh, Library says, uh, I sat on the floor covered with acid-free tissue to measure it. Absolutely, I, I bet so. And and were you, I mean, you could say if you want to, but were you um, a text, are you a textile curator or historian? Um, maybe you're a library, a librarian. <laughs> um, but that's interesting. Very, very interesting. And if you have any insight onto the size of those half square triangles, we'd love to hear it. 
I think they're an inch, but it was also a long time ago. So if you don't remember, that's okay. Anyway, I'm just, I'm, I'm loving this, uh, this variation she did on this. It's just so great. I mean, I've seen a lot of turkey tracks quilts, but they always have the same, you know, the turkey track part is always the same color. I don't know. She varied it. And I love the fabric she used. I mean, this, this is hot. It's hot. What can I say? It's a sexy fabric. It's not, I didn't make it. <laughs> it's not my fault. Um, yeah, totally cool. And then, and then look, her, her vine, right? Of course, her signature, her signature vine there on the end. Okay. So, um, Susan McCord's undisputed masterpiece is the vine quilt that we looked at earlier. Singled out as unique and masterful by the organizers of the Oakland Museum's uh, 1981 exhibit, American Quilts, A Handmade Legacy. Uh, they talk about it a little bit, and we can go back to it if we want. Da, 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 da. Okay, yeah. Hang on. Now, now, now this is the wheel quilt. Okay, and that's the end of the text, but there's a bit about the, the crazy quilt. This is my favorite. I mean, really? <laughs> like, really? I've seen this quilt in person, uh, and it is, and then we have detail shots of it, okay, a lot of them. So you're in for a treat. But, like, it's just... I don't know like it's perfect it's a perfect quilt it's a crazy quilt with a, a soul you know like it has this completely original and, and this is the flat shot that we have we don't have a full flat shot from the quilt folk shoot so I am gonna linger just on the the flat the full thing okay that's the full thing um, yeah big time Harriet it's a Harriet moment uh, Harry Powers, you know, the cool, the, the stamp of cool. <laughs> Susan R. Michael put the emote of the Harriet, uh, like, aardvark in the chat for good reason. It's just, it's just cool. Um, by the way, it was made, so here's what they say about the crazy quilts. Um, the McCord crazy quilts um, appear strikingly unconventional to us. Susan's crazy blocks juxtapose color, texture, and shape in unusual ways, rendering, ooh, look at that. This is the wheel quilt, okay. So, uh, da, 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 rendering a rather modernistic canvas. The quilt often referred to as wheels is actually a variation of a contained crazy quilt pattern called fans. Oh yeah. In which an arc or a fan is sewn in the same position. Oh wow, that's a really close up. Hold on, we're gonna come back to that. Is sewn in the same uh, position in each block. Instead, when Susan assembled her blocks, the fans were scattered in all four corners. When she joined the blocks, these fans converged, forming dynamic, colorful wool flannel wheels. Hold on, let me get to the wheels. Yeah, there. That's, that's a great, that's a great shot. Let me just get as much as I can of it, yeah. Wow. Okay, what do you think? Um, yeah, okay, Pamela says, I'd like to talk to a quilt scholar about the making, about making quilts at night. Mary thinks they must have done it by day, but if they were, yeah, they were farmers and busy during the day, don't they need to work at night with gas lanterns? So maybe did, some did and some didn't stitch at night. I, I'd love, I'd love to know more about that. I mean, it's been my conjecture, right? And you can see in some, you know, when you see, pictures later of sewing bees and stuff they were outside a lot of the time or near windows but but I don't know and it's true I mean Susan McCord in the morning she was literally milking cows and tending to seven children it's like when did she have time to do this right at night seems like if she wasn't you know dead dog tired right um and how and where did she learn these techniques I'm going back up a little bit um and Kelly Naher says to library fan, by the way, what an incredible experience you must have had. Um, Mark, where did she learn the techniques? You know what? Was it in here somewhere? Um, I think, you know, the thing is, is it says that she was a devoted member of her Methodist Episcopal Church. So, you know, the church folks are going to be sewing and quilting. It doesn't say like who taught her, you know, but 
everybody, not everybody, but I mean, it, people sewed right back then. And if she was, if she was in Indiana and Iowa, which she was, and she was like this church going lady, you know, she, and, and, and a young girl, like going to church as a girl and everything. <clears throat> it's likely that she probably, if she didn't learn from her mom or her grandmother, she probably learned at church or at school or at school. Cause they would teach that at school too. Um, and by the way, Library Fan was uh, in grad school. Historic preservation was her specialty, but interned with the textile collection. She did an inventory of the collection. Well, that is a fabulous museum and a fabulous collection. So thank you very much. It was lovely. And they're keeping very good care of everything there because we checked it out. <laughs> um, Padma, I agree though. I, I'd like to know more about that. Um, the consistency of the stitch is amazing completely, Sue. Hey, Rachel. Hi. Um, Rachel Lynn says, usually crazy quilts have a variety of stitches. This one only has one stitch, but it's incredible. And, it, and yes, and as Sue said, it's so consistent. They're like exactly the same. It looks like it's a machine. Oh, wow. Melanie got a really tight picture. It's, oh, that's a little bit out of focus. We'll skip that one. Okay. Uh, and this is the back. Is, this, is that right? The back of the wheel? Hold on. Let, I just want to, I, I was reading and I didn't get to look at this as closely as I wanted. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Okay. It's just, it's just crazy. Crazy good. Yeah. Ooh. Okay. Um, and then, okay. And then is this the back of this one? I'm pretty sure it is. This next picture has that I scanned from the book. Okay, sorry. Yeah, 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 okay. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Oh, but that is cool to see the edge, right? To see the, it's not bound, it's stitched. Oh, that's really interesting. Hmm, interesting. I read here, I read somewhere that her, I think it was in a caption for one of these photos, um, but it's it, that she didn't use much batting, or if she did, it was just very, very thin. Um, yeah. Yep. 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 Exactly. <laughs> yes. Whose bed it went on. Back then, the children took on tasks at young ages, mm -hmm, including taking care of their younger siblings. It's true. Susan wasn't all alone in her tending to the family, right? The seven kids were doing a lot too. That is very true. So this is the back. So it says the, the blocks, the blocks were lined with scrap fabrics and show the outline of the fancy stitching. Wow. Okay. So she was making blocks. Did they say that? I think they said that. Yeah. Wait, wow, wow. This, the eye-dazzling textile, the wheels, is pieced of wool suiting and dress flannels in a variation of a crazy quilt called fans. This quilt was never finished. The blocks that contain the crazy piecing were only sewn together. It remains without filler or backing. Whoa. Whoa. You see the, you see the stitching in there? The wheels? You can see that, right? It's very faint, but I think you can see it. That's wild. This feels like a very nerdy quilt, quilt nerd show, you know? I think it's like... Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> People are like, look at that stitch. It's so consistent, you know? And we're like, oh, look at the back. Look at this terrible picture. It's so fascinating. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's good stuff. Okay. Um, all right, just a few more here. Whoops, there's two more crazy quilts, and that's it. That's all we have of Susan McCord. Um, that this is another crazy, so crazy. Um, and now this also says, Mrs. McCord never completed this crazy quilt, finishing only the pieced top. What a slouch, just kidding. It is pieced of dress velvets and a few dress or millinery ribbons and is enhanced with some fancy stitching between the blocks. There's one detail of this um, coming up next. So fancy stitching. Yeah, again, a pretty, it's it's all just the one stitching. Oh, there's the millinery ribbons down here. 
my head is covering them up. Now it's above my head. Uh, Mill and Ray ribbons. Looks very 60s jazz. It's true. <laughs> hey, right down. I agree. It's the best. Um, oh, we need a soundtrack for Ooh Ah. We do. We, here, here it goes in my notes. Sound effect Ooh Ah. That's very, very good. Yeah, I like this one too. And the um, the detail shot that they have is is really nice. Let me get it. Let me get it here. Yeah, that's great. Just, I mean, look at that red slash, right? It's so groovy. It's just like, yeah, I don't know. I know. I mean, I, I, maybe I'm maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I. Maybe I'm reading into things. But there are some kind of sexy moments in her quilts. I'm serious. I don't know. I mean, it looks like a, a cool, like a, a dress, like the, you know, some sort of, and it was dress scraps, right? But this looks like some sort of really, like, hot back of a dress or something, some sort of, or a bustier or something. I don't know. I love the idea of this farm wife being like, I could have been a Parisian fashion designer with my vine quilts and all my perfect stitches and my imagination, but it didn't go that way, and that's fine. But I'm going to make incredible, amazing quilts. That's what I'm gonna do. This is the last quilt I have for you. It's another crazy quilt and, sorry, sorry, okay. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, it's, 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 it's the best, it's the best. And this is, um, it's called Contained Crazy Quilt. And it says, this is only one of Susan's crazy quilts to have been completed. Interesting. It's an ambitious bed cover indeed. Not only is it pieced, Given a filler and the three layers tufted together, you can see that, right? All those tufts. But virtually every square is decorated with silk or cruel embroidery. And, um, da, 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 da. yeah, it says Mrs. McCord's embroidery skills were considerable, judging from this detail of a small section of a quilt, which is here. Oops. Yeah, that's a pretty good detail shot. It's great. Yeah, so she did all that embroidery too. Because, you know, that was fine. That was fine. Um, mm -hmm. Picasso-esque. A thousand percent. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It's so beautiful. Agreed, Yvonne. It's so beautiful. Yep. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yep. Bonnie Kane over in U the YouTubes says abstract impressionism. Absolutely, you know, these... These shapes, these gestures that we see in quilts, you know, it's like those, I mean, it's just not, they didn't, they didn't corner the market on these abstract expressionist shapes and, you know, moments in American art and they, you know, cause Susan McCord is like, I mean, can we just, hold on, can we just, I just want to go back to something. I mean, this is totally awesome right i mean that's like not kandinsky i don't know if i don't know what abstract impressionist i'm thinking of but a little kandinsky i don't know i mean it's it's like wild it looks like jazz it looks like jazz and then this thing i mean are you kidding me look at this look at this oh wow that's that's the full thing i mean that's just like it looks like it's a poem it's music or something you know it's wonderful. Look how the look how the wheel this wheel section right. There's these four four blocks or so that make up this wheel. I mean, it, the the wheel doesn't match. None of the wheels actually come together perfectly. You know, they're 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 misshapen or they 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 skip. They skip. You know, the wheels don't come together to make perfect circles and and it's it's brilliant it's just brilliant and she was a farm wife you know and there are so many beautiful quilts that are made by so many different kinds of people in every part of the country you know and and this woman was she had seven children and she you know she died because she got kicked by it in the head by a cow for god's sakes you know it's like and and we know her name we know her name and we know her life and that is very good. And you think about all the brilliant quilts made by people who whose names we don't know. You know, we may never know them. We know some of them, um, and that's good. But it's 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 really great that we know 
the name of the person who made this quilt. I mean, it's just, it's like, I don't know, what, uh, Jasper Johns or something? I mean, these dark wools and, and like, I don't know. It's just, it's just great. Wait, what, what year is this one? Oh, 1880s. It's like in the 1880s, somewhere in there. Crazy quilts were, 1880s is always what I kind of put them in. 1895, 1895. I mean, she was just, she was awesome. So let's take a look real quick at the, the vine quilt one more time, because they said something about, about it. I want to show you this image just because it's, and it's not the whole thing, right? This is just a section, but we could, that was as much as we could see. Library fan, you know that the collections room is only so big and I mean, this is a really important quilt, so we didn't even want to breathe on it, you know? Um, oh, great, I'll just ruin my catalog, okay. Um, but this is what they said, Susan McCord's undisputed masterpiece is her vine quilt. Um, it's constructed of 13 panels of applique vines. The execution is impressive with over 300 leaves and strip pieced buds emanating from each vine. 300 leaves and strip pieced buds. Oh yeah, those are strip pieced. I mean, I saw it, but I didn't see it. <clears throat> those buds are strip pieced. Mm-hmm. Wow. Oh man, look at that one. That's bananas. Ah, it's so small. It's so small. This detail shot is really close. I mean, we're, we're zooming in really, really close on this, but that's what it is. I hadn't, I mean, I knew it. It's like, like you see it and you know, but it wasn't until just this moment that I realized reading this, right, that the buds are, are strip pieced. Not all of them, but like most of them. Look at this one. There's five pieces in that, in this little one. Look at that. There's five pieces. She's ridiculous. She's, she's not real. She's not real. Um, few of the fabrics, with the exception of the green vines themselves, were taken from well-worn garments. A few of the pencil marks used to guide Susan quilting needle are seen in spots along the border. Interesting. The colors remain fresh even after 100 years. And this was 1988. So, so yeah, this was in 1988. So let's say it's, so it's like almost 150 years old, this quilt. I mean, that's just, just, just crazy. It's crazy. Um, the color, okay, the fabrics, including the muslin ground are crisp with sizing from the mills, indicating that the tiny scraps, as well as the completed bed cover, may never have been washed. Oh, hell no, 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 you're not washing that. No, no, no one's getting water anywhere near this quilt, said Susan McCord to her family. Yes, yeah, yeah, Lauren Kroon says, this brings up the whole art or craft topic. I know a museum stance if they choose to credit artist or maker unknown. Exactly. We talked about this on the last stream. We talked exactly about it. Hey, Jody. Jody caught it caught alive again. I'm so glad you're here, Jody. And so demented. So demented. I think they are the ties. She read the cool stuff. Oh yeah, yeah, tie that. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, yeah, totally, totally. Okay. Well, so that's that's that. Okay, that's Susan McCord. Um, I looked on YouTube to see if there were any um, videos about her, but there aren't. I should make one, don't you think? We should make one. Um, there, here's one more factoid about the vine quilt. Okay, just one more. The vine itself is of a previously used calico, but the applique leaves and strip pieced buds appear to be of unused scraps. There are two distinct stitching styles and two different colors of thread used to secure the scraps to the white cotton panel. Perhaps Mrs. McCord receives some assistance in constructing this complex textile. She wasn't too proud to ask for a little help, maybe, which is good. Okay, so pretty cool. Pretty cool, right? That's what I think. Okay, so that's that. Now before, I'm gonna take a quick break and come back with Susan Hoffman. Susan Hoffman, we go from Susan McCord to Susan Hoffman. I mean. This is this is why this is why the quilt nerd show is so much fun. Because look at where we're going to go next. Look at this. 
that's where we're going next. Hold on. That's where we're going next. I mean, it's another Susan making quilts a hundred years later. I mean, well, almost a hundred years later. Susan Hoffman started making quilts in the 1970s with Molly Upton. I have amazing things to read to you about this person. Amazing, amazing pictures. It's a totally different style. It's a completely different era. But we have a Susan who is, you know, now a famous name in the quilt canon right so why we're gonna we're gonna look at why and i'm gonna learn along with you because i haven't read all this stuff i just pull it together um so but before we do that i have this is just a random thing it's a very random thing um as i was looking through oh oh i almost forgot wait 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 i almost forgot something i almost forgot this this is important look i found there's this place ivory spring okay ivory spring it's a blog Okay, about, about, Wendy Shepard is from Southeast Asia. She came to the United, this is Wendy Shepard's website blog, okay? IvorySpring.wordpress.com. She came to the United States for her tertiary education with degrees in chemical engineering. Uh, years later, she lives with her family in Northern Virginia. Okay, so we can learn all about Wendy Shepard. She's published, oh, she, she authored books for Landauer Publishing, three quilts three quilt books she's been published in quilt in, uh publications in australia uk and france okay she's a big deal okay i did not read about wendy <clears throat> very much but look at what she look at what she has so this is a post from 2017 look at this free patterns using wyndham fabrics vine so so this is the quilt obviously we know this we know this quilt so she did two designs for Wyndham fabrics because Wyndham in 2017 released a fabric line based on the vine quilt, the Susan McCord vine quilt. Oh, click here to view the fabric group. Cool, we can do that. Probably not available, but maybe available on Etsy. But look, look at this. Look at this. This is by Wendy Shepard. She made this pattern. You can get this pattern and make this quilt. And there's another one too. There's two of them. Hey, cool, Susan R. Michael says, Ivory Spring was one of the first blogs that she followed. That's awesome. That's so great. Oh, a Susan Hoffman piece was in the MFA show. Mm, I'm gonna be bitter a long time about not being able to see that show. Anyway, this is really cool. She, I mean, she nailed the, she got it right with this vine. She really did a great job. That's so cool. So I don't know if you can still get this pattern or not, but when I was looking for images and stuff, I came across this and that's pretty impressive. And then this is the other one, which is really, I mean, it's pretty interesting. She really reinterpreted the vine, I think in a very original way. And I'm saying interesting and original, not to avoid saying that I like it or that it's good. I do like it and it is good. It is very unusual, right? This sort of chopped off rectangular block it's totally different but i mean she's she did not like cut corners on this vine i mean my god she really went for it or is that a cheater oh i think that's a print because <laughs> look don't you think it's maybe a print like is it is it a because look here here on the side you see there's this it might it's oh sorry hey come here it's the, um, I think it's the border print. Yeah, yeah. Do you see what I'm seeing over here? I think that's where the seam is. But anyway, yeah. Cool. The Odd Fellows Flowers, really? <gasps> that's so great. I love it. Hey, what's going on? Okay. So, yeah, so there you go. A little bit extra. Say, okay. So that is Ivory Spring, Wendy Shepherd kicking butt on the whole fabric designer, quilt designer thing. Okay. So I was looking for all this stuff and this is very quick. This is a very quick thing, but I have never heard of, and I wanted to ask you all if you had ever heard of Eye of God quilt pattern. Eye of God quilt pattern with Greek key border, um, circa 1920. I have never heard of the eye of God quilt block or pattern. This is a very unusual quilt. I love it. I think it's awesome. Um, it was Stella Rubin who recently 
passed away, that quilt dealer, and her whole like collection is being sold, I think in January, maybe, um, unless it's already passed. But this was actually in first dibs, that you know fancy schmancy auction site that I like to hang out in. Um, and it was like $2,500, but on the Stella Rubin side, it was like $1,800. Anyway, um, hey, Misha. Hey, Misha. Um, and so I was like, I have God, what's up with this? So I was looking around and I found a quilt called Ojo de Dios, <laughs> which, you know, I have God, right? Yeah, I have God, which is cool. This is by a person. We can find this timeless treasures. Okay, um, I can find out who this is. I can find out who this is. I'm sorry, I don't have it in front of me. But you know, this is cool. But it's completely different from the other one. Okay, and okay, God's eye. So the right down says God's eye is a weaving thing you do as a kid. That's right. Okay, that's it looks like that. It looks like a the weaving thing. Okay, that makes total sense. But then, but then I found this, which makes sense too. So Maria Ambrose, uh, Mara Ambrose, you may know of her. She's very famous. She's extremely talented and very cool. Anyway, she sells her quilts. She sells ready-made, handmade quilts um, on her website, Folk Fibers. She does hand dyes. She hand dyes all her stuff and she's totally cool. And she won like a Martha Stewart named like the next craft superstar or something years ago. And Mara was, was picked. I, when we talk about Mari Ambrose sometime, I'll, we'll talk about what exactly that was, but she was like one of the next American crafters or something like that. It was a really big deal. And she also made a quilt for John Mayer. Yeah, the musician John Mayer. She made uh, a quilt for him to stand in front of. Oh, we got to talk about her. She's so great. Um, and then she also made a quilt that was like a single um, for like a CD single. And it's really cool. Anyway, so this is called God's Eye. And then this is a quilt block. I found a quilt block that is called God's Eye, and which doesn't look anything really like the other one. I found another example of this God's Eye block. That's all I had. That's it. I don't have anything else. I just was like, what is this? What is this God's Eye business, you know? So I went and looked for it. Yeah, exactly. So everybody's saying, you know, the God's eye thing is the the weaving thing, you know? And that I remember that now as soon as you all started saying, yeah, God's eye. Oh, de Dios. Okay, great, great, great. Oh, de Dios. Yeah, yarn and popsicle sticks, exactly. Yeah. So this is sort of like that too, but with a with a twist. With a twist, I guess. There's there's that with the full quilt. It's cool. It's cool. It's it's just very different things. I guess you've got that center diamond thing going on. But anyway, so that's it. I really like this, and I like the Greek key thing going on too. I really, I think it's groovy. So I thought I'd share it with you. That's all. Um, okay, so let's take a quick break. Um, and by the way, Bonnie Kane made a really good point uh, over on YouTube. She said of uh, Susan uh, McCord that Susan McCord was a Methodist, as we read, and idle hands are the devil's work, right? You always have to have something to do. And I think, I, I was thinking of that too when they talked about how much she went to church and just the detail in that in that woman's work is, you know, <laughs> she did not have idle hands. She, she nailed it. <laughs> no idle hands in the McCord household. Um, okay, so uh, we're going to do a quick break and then come back and talk about Susan Hoffman. And yeah, that's just the way it's going to be. Okay, so have... I'll be right back. Oh 
Okay, I've got the uh, Christmas playlist on that, yeah, on the Be Right Back screen still, but I did change it for the for the opening. Oh, that's a that's a note for me. I have to, have to update <clears throat> update all <laughs> sorry update all graphics and music. Okay. Um, so I got a little wine. I think it's time. What is it? Eight forty-five. Matches my <clears throat> sweatshirt. Um, actually, in my sweatshirt matches my sweatpants. <laughs> I've got my little tracksuit on. It's not a tracksuit, but it is a matching uh, sweatshirt and sweatpants. I just felt like being a mulberry. Yes, mulberry. Um, okay, so. Uh, hi, Susan Kelly. Hello, hello. Uh, wait a minute, wait a minute. I look over at the chat and I see Cool Ranch Doritos. Myra has Cool Ranch Doritos and Cabernet. <gasps> and the HSTs are starting to pile up. I'm so in a zone. Myra is in her sewing studio. The quilt people know this, but you know, for people who don't know, Myra is sewing and she's in the zone, okay? Uh, She's so in the zone, she asked her husband not to cook dinner because you don't have time to sit down and eat. Myra, oh, nerding out while working is so nourishing. A thousand percent. And so are Cool Ranch Doritos. They are nourishing also. In their way. In their way. Um, keep at it, yes. Keep going. So, all right. Let's talk about Susan Hoffman. Myra needs to, whoa. Um, Myra, we gotta, we gotta keep things going. We're not slowing down. There's so much to do. Okay, so let's get small and talk about Susan number two. Okay, so who is this person, and why should we why should we care, right? Um, I have so many pictures for you, so many. I like saying that because I want you to know that you're gonna have a visual feast. I don't always have enough, pic you know. I won't have as many pictures as I want, you know, but I really try because. It's all about that. Okay, so let's let's look at Susan Hoffman. Uh, like, actually, look at her face. <laughs> Hang on. Mm -hmm. It was interesting putting this together. Was interesting because so this is Susan Hoffman, and and this was on her website. So I didn't find other pictures of her. Um, hang on one second. I have to do this real quick. Um, I didn't find too many pictures of her, uh, or or any of them that are newer. Um, I found pictures of her from the past, and we'll see a few of those. Um, but it was interesting putting this together because the thing is, is that Susan Hoffman is always, in my experience, is always tied contextually with Molly Upton. And Molly Upton, we've talked about on this show before, it's been a little while now, but Molly Upton is very famous because she and Susan Hoffman, as we'll see, work together uh, together early in their careers, right? Molly Upton is famous because she was very talented, but also she committed suicide very early on in her in her life. I mean, she was very young. And she left behind this, like, obviously too small body of work that was pretty awesome, you know? It was pretty awesome. I Sometimes I get, I get nervous when, when someone, you know, I don't know. I mean, there can be a kind of a cult of personality sometimes with Molly Upton, I see. And, I, you know, I'm not trying to throw shade. I'm just saying that, like, there are a lot of very, very talented quilt makers working at that time, working later, who are making extraordinary work, who, you know, the circumstances of their body of work really aren't you know, that. So, I mean, I just, but, but you look at Molly Upton's work and it's amazing, right? Okay, but, but Susan Hoffman was right there, you know. And so when I was putting th this together, I was going to start with this picture because it's it's of Susan Hoffman and Molly Upton in like 1974. But then I was like, no, Susan Hoffman is her own woman. Susan Hoffman is her own person. I'm not going to start out with a Molly Upton thing. I'm not going to because she might, she probably loves that because she loved her friend and she loved her partner or whatever. But I mean, her co- they weren't partner. I don't mean that they were partners. I don't think they were. Maybe, I don't know. But she she's her own person is what I'm trying to say. So I was like, no, we're going to start with with Hoff. You know, with the Hoff. 
Hey, Quilting Auntie, thank you for subscribing with Prime. I really appreciate it. That is awesome. You're getting me closer to the next goal, which is 120 subscribers. And by the way, I had a goal of, what was it? 50 subscribers in the month of December. We got pretty close. I'll have to look at the numbers and, and figure out how we've done. Um, for everybody who's subscribed, it means a lot to me and I'm really glad that you that you did. And if you haven't subscribed yet, I hope that you will because um, yeah, I don't know. It's great. It's like, it's a good thing. You'll feel really cool if you do. <laughs> I don't know. Um, but uh, yeah, I'll figure out. And, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have a giveaway. I mentioned it a couple weeks ago. I just have to figure out how to do it properly so that it's the giveaway is like that it functions properly. It's a quilt. I'm going to give away a quilt. Yeah, it's true. And it's not the G the weird Jesus one I got for on eBay. I'll show, I'll show you that. I haven't even opened that one. It came the weird pictorial quilt that has like the Jesus, like looking really close at you. Yeah. Um, I'll, 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 I'll take care of it. <laughs> I'll show you soon enough, but I'm going to do a giveaway too. I, I need to find ways to give back to you all, you know, for subscribing and all of that. It's important. So I'm working on it, but thank you for subscribing. Quilting Auntie, I appreciate it. Okay. Um, so that's Susan Hoffman. And I thought I would go with one of her quilts, two of her quilts, actually. We've seen this one now. Okay. Let's look at another one before we talk about anything else. So I'm gonna read her artist statement, okay? Give her the floor. Um, she says, and this is from her website, okay? Susan D. Hoffman artist statement, quote, while quilt making was not considered a fine art, I saw no reason for it to be kept peripheral. Like the blues or jazz, oh, we just said that. It could become a powerful avenue of expression for a group who found themselves outside the mainstream of cultural life. From the beginning, the quilt allowed me a freedom to create unfettered. It was a blank canvas on which to paint outside the traditional forms. In 1970, while teaching myself how to create a quilt, I became aware of the limitless possibilities the medium held. I discovered that I was an artist and that quilts were my medium of choice. No one was more surprised than me, well, maybe my parents, she says, because in 1973, there was no such thing as a professional quilt artist. Oh, that's so true. She really was a pioneer, and Molly Upton too. I, you know, amazing. Look at this, how she's worked in satin, you know, in these little parts. So cool. Um, Susan continues, but I realized that what that was what I was, a quilt artist. And while it's been a very lonely path, I've never turned back and I'm grateful to have found something that I love. Since that time, the medium has evolved to include technologies. I'm gonna get to a couple, I'm gonna, we're, we're grooving on this artist statement. Let me go to this. Since that time, the medium has evolved to include techniques that combine computerized technology and innovations in the making of textiles, but I continue to choose everyday fabric. Interesting, collected from everyday life as my palette. It speaks to me because from birth to death, every single human being lives in intimate contact with fabric. Preach, it's so true, worldwide. Poor or rich, fabric is accessible to and used by literally all people in all walks of life on a daily slash nightly basis. Each one of us has a familiarity and connection to the language of fabric, no matter our station in life. You know what? I thought it'd be fun to do like two Susans, you know, the two Susans. But it's great because like, what would Susan McCord have said if someone told her or asked her to write an artist statement? I mean, in many ways she'd be like, uh, I'm busy, but also like an artist statement. I mean, I went to art school for grad school, you know, and I didn't have to write an artist statement because I went to, it was in the writing program, <laughs> you know, but the painters and stuff, you know, I had to read artist statements. They're really hard to write. I mean, they're really hard to write. And so, you know, here's Susan Hoffman with her artist statement, very articulate and whatnot. And, and Michael James, I read his artist statement the other day, but you know, Wait, who got married? Does somebody get married? Oh, hey, Word and Bird nerd. 
Hey, awesome. Okay, there's the wedding dress with your future daughter-in-law and her mother. Congratulations. Yeah, that's awesome. Did you did you find the dress? Did she find one? We want to know. Um, but yeah, an artist statement. I mean, what would Susan McCord have said about her wheel quilt? You know, it's interesting because it's like, I mean, I've, I've read a lot of times that like, you know, women, it was actually, I think it was, it was, I think it was women from G's Bend at, at some point, something I was reading, you know, that had to do with that phenomenon, you know, that, that some woman said, like, you know, we didn't think of our quilts as art, you know, I mean, they were just, we made them and they were important and they were, but they were to be used. And, you know, it wasn't like, I'm making this and this is art. And, and so, you know, here you have Susan Hoffman, who's in the 1970s, right? Second wave feminism is happening. The Whitney Museum exhibit had happened in 71. And there was like, you know, the 60s had happened, you know, Susan McCord, 60s had not happened, you know, so I don't know, it's interesting to see these two women in these two very, very different times as quilt makers, you know, that's why I say it all the time, the show will go on forever, because there's so much to talk about. There's so because people just keep making quilts, you know, they keep making these quilts, and they look so different from the quilts that came before, and yet they look very similar. But yeah, I just think about Susan McCord and her, her jazz, right, her jazz quilt, and what she would have said. Jobs. Okay. Um, <laughs> my work is rooted in the quilt tradition. Whoa, sorry, sorry. I'm going to scoot over to, yeah, to a few more. I realize now I kind of did this out of order. Ooh, look at that hot pink down at the bottom. I really like that. Um, my work is rooted in the quilt tradition. Back to Susan. But I take this as a point of departure in furthering this form of expression. Like many traditional quilts, my work is not intended to be used as a bed as a bed covering. Oh, like many traditional quilts. Oh, I think she I think she means unlike many traditional quilts. My work is not intended to be used up as a bed covering, nor is it purely decorative. It is to be experienced as art. And yeah, okay. Fabric, she says, has a musical resonance. Oh my god, jazz is, music is like it's like the theme of the day. Fabric has a musical resonance that inspires me. Um, my approach to quilt making is painterly, preferring to recycle fabrics that already have a history. This is a palette endlessly rich with associations, both personal and cultural, as well as in the formal considerations of value, hue, and texture. Wow, cool. This is great. Oh, I have names for these, but I made a PDF today. That's why the names aren't on here. I tried to do something different because sometimes the preview thing that I use, you know, it like goes away and it's so awful. So I made a PDF of all these images that I'm showing you, but I realize now the drawback is that I don't have the names for them, which is lame or the year is not great. But most of the, most of the quilts you're seeing, the, all the, the ones you've seen so far are like 70s and 80s. Um, Okay, so there's a little bit more of this. For me, a quilt begins with an inner inkling, even a thirst for a particular pair or group of fabrics. I lay the pieces of fabric down on the floor like a brush stroke. Eventually, the scraps are brought together in a, into a whole new cloth, a new whole cloth. It is this alchemy that I'm after. I like that, alchemy. Hand quilting the pieced front breathes life into it. So she's hand quilting, seems like like only hand quilting, as I draw with the thread, oh, that pieced front, batting, and backing are sandwiched together. The quilt becomes subtly sculptural, a base relief, as the hills and valleys created by the quilting stitches create light and shadows that are in counterpoint to the piecework while also reinforcing it. Hopefully, the finished quilt engages the mind, body, and spirit, conveying warmth, both li literally and figuratively. The colors on this one, oh, love it. Super here for that. Okay, so now there's more quilts to show you, but now let's talk about Molly Upton and Susan because their story really is 
I mean, it's not one story, but their story together is a big part of her life and her story, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Yvonne says she appreciates the artist's statement, but does disagree that even a bed quilt, right, is art. So, like, you know, don't, like, put put bed quilts below art. I just, I, yeah, I hear what you're saying. That is what she did. She, she made a hierarchy, right? Thousand percent. Um, okay. So this is Susan Hoffman writing from the Pear Collection to the Corn Bee Gallery. Now, this was on her website. I'm not sure. I think this is something she wrote for an exhibit. It makes sense for an exhibit of her and Molly Upton's quilts, like, together. Which has happened a lot, that they're exhibited together. Um, we'll see. I think I'm right, but... Let's find out. Okay, so quote from Susan Hoffman. It has been, and Molly Upton remembers the, is the girl on the right, I believe, who committed suicide at a very young age and left behind her quilts. Okay, Susan Hoffman. It has been said that I taught Molly Upton how to quilt, but this is how it actually happened. Teaching myself, I had already made several quilts beginning in my senior year. This is from a blog. Someone took pictures of, I mean, I guess it's the exhibit, something, a, a, a catalog from an exhibit, something like that. So, so here you have Molly Upton on the left, a quilt made in 1974 called Greek, and then Susan Hoffman's quilt called Moonlight. Yeah, the picture's not great, but you can see like the deal, right? With the two of them, okay. So Susan continues, teaching myself, I had already made several quilts beginning in my senior year of high school in 1970. What fascinated me were the unique effects that could be achieved by piecing together fabrics and not the, and not the sewing per se. Then one summer before college, Molly and I opened a little store in a shed in Vermont, which we called the Front Porch Out Back. Oh, this is, an, this is a lecture or something. Some, these are, this is a slide. She's taken... This person has taken a picture of some kind of presentation on Molly Upton and Susan Hoffman. Okay, that's what we're seeing here. Okay. Um, so they had a store in Vermont. That's, I didn't know that. It's so interesting. And Susan says the front porch out back was where we made all of our merchandise from beads, leather, and fabrics that we purchased from New York City wholesale markets. Among our goods were some simple articles of clothing. Molly knew how to sew somewhat. In the fall, we went off to college. Molly to McAllister. Oh wow, that's that's their shop. That's Molly Upton and Susan Hoffman. Again, not a, the best picture we've ever had, but but not bad. I'm glad we have it at their little store in '71. Wow. Um, we went off to college. Molly went to McAllister, in Minnesota, and. Susan went to the University of Denver. She says, a few years later, we became roommates living in two furnished rooms with a shared kitchen across the hall in Cambridge, Massachusetts. We decided one day to each make a quilt. Maybe we could make a little money on the side. From various projects, we, eat, we both had a small stockpile of fabrics. Using just what we already had on hand, we tore the fabric into strips. Somebody said, strips. I saw you, I see, I see you, I see you talking about those strips. Um, no templates, no measuring, no scissor, uh, scissors only to cut the length of the strip that might feel right. She had her pile and I had mine. And side by side, we each began to lay strips out vertically on the floor, like brush strokes, it felt to me. Let me go to one of her quilts here, okay? I've got more, I've got something else, a Molly Upton thing that's gonna blow your mind, okay. When each composition seemed complete, I showed Molly how to sew the strips into rows and the rows to each other to make the piece front. Cheers, Imana. Mm, love it. Um, we decided on a common border to frame them, uh, black, a black border to frame them so that in addition to the use of vertical strips, they formed a kind of pair. Okay. Oh, it's interesting. So they really were working together. I mean, they really, wow. So this quilt's made in 99, you can see on the, um, on the corner on the left. Um, 
Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I showed Molly how to sandwich together the front, the backing, and the batting. We tied the three layers together, so technically these were coverlets, not quilts. Over the course of making these two quilts side by side, I realized quilts could be art. Wow, that's pretty awesome. Um, I was, it was a life-changing moment for me. Initially, Molly didn't agree with me, and we had many lively discussions on the subject of quilts and the arts, literature and music, as well as visual disciplines. By the end of each making one half of what we came of what we came to think of as the first pair of the pair collection, I was shocked to realize that I was an artist. Quilting was my medium, and that my work was intended not for a bed but a wall, properly lit, a properly lit space, properly lit with a space of its own. More significant than showing Molly the basic how-to of what I had been doing for several years was my showing slash convincing her that quilts could be art. By the act of making a quilt and by our conversations, Molly quickly became, I'm gonna zoom in here, this is really great. Um, Molly quickly became uh, as excited as I was to explore quilt making as an art form. We knew of no one else who was doing this had no relatives who made quilts. You know what? Yeah, I mean, this was 1970, like four or one, seven, yeah, 70, yeah. I mean, it's early 70s, the art quilt thing, they re really were doing this early. They were the only ones, but they were the only ones they knew, and that makes sense. It felt like anything was possible. We decided not to, not to try to sell the two quilts, but to create a body of work and then trying to find an art gallery to represent us as, as artists. I'm gonna come back to that one. Um, I love this quilt. Uh, the idea of pursuing paths as professional quilt artists was unheard of, but one we felt compelled to pursue. Okay, hang on. Um, Da, 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 da. Okay, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. there's a little bit more about the pairs, and it says I don't have images of these pairs of quilts together, which I would love to see. I don't want to go too far into that. Um, Molly and I had a continual dialogue about what we each were doing, um, exploring and sharing what the medium was capable of, always working separately on our own quilts both in the brief period making, uh, of making the pairs and then afterwards. We shared what we were reading, reading, listening to, and seeing. Sometimes when one of us was working, the other would read aloud. Oh, God, that sounds amazing. Oh, yeah, yeah, she did sign that quilt on the front. That's cool. Yeah, I didn't think of... Oh, and she signed this one on the front, too. That is great. We talk about that a lot, don't we, right? We label our quilts on the back. Painters sign their things on the front, right? Or we don't label our quilts at all. But she, she, yeah, she's signing them on the front. That's pretty badass. Hmm. Should we bring it back? Should you sign your quilt on the front? Maybe that's a thing. Maybe that's a thing. Maybe I'm going to do it. I think I'm going to do it. My COVID quilt is almost done. I'm really, really almost done. I'm going to sign it. Ow. <laughs> I'm going to sign it on the front. We should all make a quilt and sign it on the front. What are you working on? Uh, uh, Padma. Little Bird Stitch says, no, I'm kidding. But why, you know, sign it. Sign it on the front. Okay. Um, okay, da, 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 So, oh, wow, cool. We wanted a gallery. Oh, wait, no, they were reading to each other. I love this. It's so great. It was competitive, Susan says, with Molly Upton in the best way possible. I'm going to zoom in here on these flannels. I love these flannels. And this circular quilting is just terrific. Um, she says it was competitive in the best way possible with Molly. Challenging, empowering, mutually supportive, a thoroughly engaging, nuanced, enlivening, enlivening give and take. God, we should all be so lucky, right, to have that kind of relationship. Amazing. It would be most accurate to say that as art quilters, we were made for each other. We wanted a gallery. So we spent days taking the train to and from Manhattan, carrying our quilts through the streets. It's great. God, I love these young chicks, right? They're awesome art and they're like, oh, I love you. I love you too. Let's do this. Let's go to Manhattan again and beat the pavement, <laughs> the mean streets and find a gallery. Um, 
they carried their quilts through the streets because they had no photos. That's what she says here. Susan says, we experienced lots of rejection and ridicule with most people telling us it was impossible. After days, we got a tip to try the offices of Vogue. I think it was Elizabeth or Liz we were supposed to see. We lugged the quilts into Manhattan and sat outside Liz's office on the first day, but she was too busy. The second day, it was the same. On the third day, we had figured out where her office was and simply marched in and started laying quilts out on the floor as if we were rug merchants. They went to Vogue. Oh, so cool. The editor stopped what she was doing. She took the gum out of her mouth and said, Leo must see this. She called Leo and said she was bringing someone up. We had no idea who Leo was. We packed up the quilts and then schlepped the suitcases and duffel bags up the staircase to the next floor and we were ushered into the features editor at Vogue, Leo Lerman, a legendary, one-of-a-kind, wonderful man. <gasps> but we had no idea who he was as we were ushered into his office. This is like, wow. I love this one. This is so great. I love this quilt. I love it. I love it. It's so simple, but there's, I mean, and I le really like, and I didn't know, that she uses fabrics from life. She does not, and there's her signature again. This is from 2008. It's called Elements of Life. Okay. You know, she's using textiles from, from around, you know, and I don't, the fabric companies don't like to hear this, but I mean, I, I have not purchased fabric in a long time. I, I am, I don't want to, you know, the COVID quilt I'm making, like I used what I had. I have just, I just don't have the will to buy a lot of fabric right now. I don't know. So maybe it's all going to be, um, you know, scraps and things from life. Like Susan Hoffman, I mean, she's not the only person to do that, but not as not a lot of people, I think, who make quilts a lot are just sourcing like secondhand fabric because the fabrics are so wonderful that we get as quilters, you know, and you can get whatever you want, but it's interesting, right? To just reclaim stuff. So anyway, so back at Vogue, okay, we were ushered in by a nervous editor who had been avoiding us for three days and she proudly presented us to Leo. Wow. He looked at the quilts. Wait a minute, hold on. Molly and I began to efficiently take out our quilt tapestries and lay them on the floor, but not much was said. We had learned to let the quilts speak for themselves. By this point, we'd been in quite a few galleries and offices, but Leo's stood out. His desk was clear, except for an eggplant, and he wore purple socks. Great. There were lots of windows. Um, he looked at the quilted tapestries, and I kid you not, within a few moments, he said, what do you want, the Museum of Modern Art? Molly and I glanced at each other. We said, yes, someday, but we're not ready yet. Right now, we just want a reputable gallery to represent us. He picked up the phone and started calling, calling art galleries. Quote, I have two young women here in my office. They make what they call quilted tapestries. One looks about 13, one looks about 14. I think you should look at their work. Unquote. And then this, the last paragraph says, soon after, maybe it was the same day, or a short time after, I can't remember. Oh, wait, this is the next thing, sorry, sorry. Uh, Molly and I went to meet Jill Cornbley, one of the art dealers that Leo called. Let me go up to this, yeah. Her gallery at the time was located on the ground floor of a townhouse, okay, da da da. We showed her the quilts, she was quiet, reserved. Without saying much, this dealer said she wanted to represent Molly and me. There would be a contract and she would give us a show. Molly and I left her gallery and literally jumped, jumped, and screamed for joy on the sidewalk, hugging each other. We had a two-person show there in 1975 and I had a one-person show in 1980. We had done what everyone said couldn't be done and opened doors not just for ourselves, but hopefully for the art of quilt making. Hell yeah. Isn't that cool? Isn't that so cool? So check this out. I know, bless that guy, right? Leo, love him love him um so check this out so one of the things that i found i found a couple oh here here's one thing this was from a blog but this this is two uh susan hoffman quilts done she did them in different 
ways. <laughs> there's, there's two like colorways, right? So this is from an exhibit. I would love to see an exhibit of her work. At QuiltCon in 2016, I think, or 27, yeah, 2016, they did a, no, 20, ow, 2018, I don't know, whatever. It was a QuiltCon and, and they did a Molly Upton exhibit, but I'm, I want to, I want Susan Hoffman, man. I think, I think I'm like Team Hoffman. I don't know, just because everybody is all about Molly Upton, but I'm into Susan. So, um, so check this out. So here's, this is a review. Oh yeah, I remember. I got this image a few, it's like last week or something. It's just awful. But this is a review here. This is a review, whoa, from the New York Times in 79. Molly and Susan, right? Is this both of them? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Modern quilts beyond necessity. Modern quilts, right? Isn't that crazy? We have such a different relationship to that term, right? Listen to this, this is crazy. This is great, this is great. Modern quilters are certainly no less talented than their forebears. Are you dead? I mean, can you believe that? The modern quilter, I mean, that's what we call modern quilters, but like, we're all modern quilters. If Anyway, kind of hilarious. Let me see if I can get my head in this, like, like, like I'm in the, here, watch, watch this, this will be funny. Here, I'll, I'll just be in the thing. Look, see? See, I can't do it all, but I know how to do that. Okay. I won't read all of this, but. Modern quilters are certainly no less talented than their forebears, but their craft has suffered from the philosophy of modernism as well as material progress. <gasps> Maybe I will read all of this. That's amazing. Deprived of its social function. Oh, we're reading this. Deprived of its social function. Folk art, such as quilting, has been kicked upstairs to a kind of retirement status among the fine arts. Hmm. As a result, its practitioners tend to compete with high art, feeding on it rather than on personal experience or nature. Also, they seem as a group, folk artists, okay, to be engaged in a kind of minority struggle for antithetical goals. Uh, this is a bit wordy, Vivian. The retrieval of lost innocence on the one hand, ugh, on the, and on the other, recognition as serious artists in all the senses with which that term is now loaded. The, this conflict is very apparent in the display of quilts, okay, here we go, by Molly Upton, that is on view at the Darien Public Library through January 27th. Unhappily, there is no way of knowing whether and in what way Miss Upton might have resolved the conflict <gasps> since she committed suicide in her 24th year by jumping off the Golden Gate Bridge in 1977. I thought, I thought this was going to be more about the both of them. I mean, well, this is about Molly Upton. I mean, I, I you know, I'm not going to read all this because it's we're talking about Susan Hoffman and they quote, I mean, they talk to her about. Okay, that's fine. So, so we know what happened with Molly and 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 Susan. So I'm not gonna not gonna do that. But I do want you to appreciate how I put myself inside that box. Okay. All right. Enough. Let's 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 get back to let's put cut me down to size basically. Um, okay. So so that was something else. But I thought it was a review of their show. Anyway, they did get reviews of their show in the New York Times, I believe, that after they were represented by that gallerist. Okay, so, yep, yep, yep. And Ivana says, by the way, I have an abundance of fabric, much of which my hubby, Cooper, surprised me. Hey, hey, Opossum Blood, I'm so glad you're following. That's great, and by the way, if, if you aren't following me and you like the show, make sure to click follow. Is that right? Yeah. So you get a notification when I go live because I do three shows a week, but sometimes I do more. And so you can be notified and, and hop on the show um, and subscribe to That'd be great. So Yvonne says much of her fabric was purchased by her husband, Cooper. Um, he was on a business trip and saw a sign that said fabric sale and bought so much, literally over 600 yards for you. Oh my God. Well, we, we love Cooper. I mean, yeah. 
he's he's he supports your art. That is for sure. We know that. Um, and we love it. But I do enjoy a day at a secondhand store, Ivana says, that can produce a great stash as well. Thousand percent. I love it. I like that mixing. I like that mixing. I approve highly of this idea of mixing. And yeah, I've got enough fabric too. Like, you know, I'm going to use that as well. You know, it's a, it's a good, that's a good approach. Totally. That's totally cool. Um, <laughs> mother nature, is that close enough to not your mother's quilts, your, not your grandmother's quilts? I was, I was, I have to say it crossed my mind. I'm like, am I going to read, am I going to read that line and have to take a shot of tequila? It's Monday. So I was hoping that I <laughs> maybe wouldn't have to do that. Okay. So who is this that we're looking at? This is sort of the last section of this Susan, Susan show. Okay. This about famous or prominent or important quilt makers, like a biography, right? Of, of a number of them, like, you know, a biography on Susan McCord, like, ugh, I don't know if I want to read all about Susan McCord, but I would definitely read a chapter about her and then a chapter about Susan Hoffman and Molly Upton, right? This amazing story. Oh, you know what? I want to write that. You know, Jill, if you want to write it, you need to write it. <laughs> don't worry. I'm not going to like swoop in. But wouldn't that be awesome? Like, ooh, we should come up with a list. Let's come up with a the yeah the anthology but put crash so so let me let me finish this up okay we we've, we've been on for a while I told I thought it'd be long and it is the show tonight okay so this is Susan and Peter Hoffman yeah Jill cool you want me to go for it I mean obviously you're in the acknowledgments right and but okay anyway I just don't ever want to be like if your dream is to write a book you must write it I will I will exit immediately okay um. Susan and Peter Hoffman are both artists, okay? This is her brother, and, and, and they had a show together. Look at this. They had a show together uh, called Affinities. And, and someone might be able, well, certainly someone could figure out when, what year it was. I'm so sorry, but I, I printed out the press release. And I, gr I grabbed a Peter comments that his technique is, quote, strongly rooted, rooted in an intuitive process. Um, quilts, you know, that are pieced together in this fashion, right? It's improv, running, piecing, whatever. There's a lot of big pieces, you know. Hey, so mean. Thank you for following. Um, there are uh, quilts with, with large pieces, you know, big chunks. Uh, right, hook and eye, I like that. But it's, I really, I'm really into it because it looks different. It's the plaid. It's like there's always plaid in her stuff, which I just think is rad. Anyway. Okay, yeah, do we have titles for the, do we have titles for the thing? Um, the triptych, yeah, yeah, yeah. Book title. If you quilt it, they will come. Great quilters of the last 150 years. I like it. Uh, great quilters of the last 150 years. That is an excellent, you know subtitle, you know, tagline kind of thing. It's great. Yeah, Jill says, God, I love me some plaid. I think I love plaid too. I mean, look how, look how great it looks. Oh, it's so good. And then this down on the bottom, I wonder if that's her work or his. Okay, there's just a little bit more here. Um, shown together in the inspirational Wilson Museum Galleries, Designed by Hugh Newell. Wow, that's beautiful. That gallery is so nice. That gallery is really nice. And I love, I'm, oof. This show, I'm, I'm here for it. It's so great. I love it. I love it. I love everything about it. It's bright and it's like, there's this whimsy, but it's really, it's like very tasteful. I love it. It's just fantastic. Uh, okay, yeah. Mm hmm. Um, da 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 cool that they exhibited together. Oh, wow, there's a lot more. Bulk um, issue of uh, in Vermont, and it was it was so cold that time. Uh, I don't know. It's antique. Up until 100 years, it's vintage. And that's like a standard thing for any any item, you know, furniture or furniture or or whatever, antiques are 100 years or older and vintage is anything less than 100 years, I believe. Earlier tonight, for me to kind of talk through this like survey thing, 